On a frigid November night in 1957, a murder investigation would lead police to the farmhouse of Ed Gein. Within minutes, deputies found a headless, nude, mutilated female body hanging upside down in a shed. To see one of the well-known people in Plainfield, well-liked person in Plainfield, hanging there upside down and uh, dressed out like a deer, uh, it's hard to explain how a man uh, feels when he sees something like that. The butchered remains of a woman named Bernice Warden were just the beginning. Deputies now journeyed into the private lair of Ed Gein. The farm had no electricity. They were entering a dark sanctuary uh -huh. of madness and horror. How can a guy live like this? Over here. Anatomy book. Bones. It's a human skull. It's been eating beans out of a skull, Sarge. Back around here. Over here. It's a human heart. Down there. Put it back. Like a, a liver. Okay. Mark it. Put it down to the lab. Right behind you. Right there. Right here. Human <sighs> skin. And there again. Human skin. Let's see what's in here. Ah. Look what we have here. Well, there's the gun we've been looking for. his mother. What's on a back wall? Right there. Be careful, just lift it up very carefully. Go this way. Well, I think you could describe Ed Gein in, in, as the sort of godfather of uh, serial weird type killers guy who would, would uh, carve up a woman, uh, dress her out like a deer, hang her in a shed. He's the role model for basically all the wackos in, in the world in, in, when it comes to homicide. Unfolding was a story of such evil, such horror, the world was in disbelief. Yet more gruesome details were still to come. Back with that in a moment. <laughs> The secret gory life of little Ed Gein was now exposed, 
And almost as gruesome was the curiosity of a world that had never witnessed such unspeakable crimes. Curiosity seekers would descend on a sleepy farm town that would leave its mark on America's conscience for decades. Central Wisconsin has changed little in 30 years. It's still a land of farms, woods, and ordinary small towns. But in one village, people can't forget Ed Gein, the shy little bachelor that was to brand the name Plainfield on maps across the world. He'd play with the kids. They'd jump on his back, and he'd give them horsey back rides and things like that. He was just a, just a nice, odd little man. Well, Ed Gein was always a person that everybody liked to pick on. They'd take a bottle of beer and they would open it up and put a little whiskey in it to give him a little more jolt at noon there, unbeknown to him, to kind of get him going. He was, you know, he was the guy that everybody picked on. November 16th, 1957. The opening day of deer season and every able-bodied man had left for the hunt. That day, Ed Gein was to drive into town stalking his own kind of prey, Bernice Warden, the owner of a local hardware store, a woman who reminded Ed of his mother. So she went to look out the window when he put a shell in one of the 22s and shot her in the back of the head, and then dragged her out in the back platform, loaded her on her truck, and took her about a mile out of town into a bunch of pines and transferred her to his truck and took her back to his home. As Ed went to work on Bernice Warden, her son Frank, a deputy sheriff, returned from deer hunting only to discover a pool of blood in the family store. Gein, the prime suspect, was apprehended hours later after enjoying dinner at a neighbor's house. After supper, Dan Chase, he was, he was a sh uh, deputy then and then later became sheriff. He pulled up out in the road and came over and wanted to know if he asked Ed, he says, are you Ed Gein? And Ed says, yeah, and he says, well, would you come with us? In the hamlet of Plainfield, news of the murder spread like wildfire. I ran across the street over to Hills, and I rapped on the door, and I said to Irene, did you hear about the murder in Plainfield? And she said, yes, and, and uh, she told me who it was then, that it was Mrs. Worden, and she said, you'll never guess who they picked up for it. And I said, well, no, who? And uh, she said, well, Eddie Gein. And we both kind of laughed because we knew he wouldn't hurt a fly. <laughs> Within hours, the eyes of the world were riveted on Plainfield, Wisconsin. Dan Hanley was one of the first reporters on the scene. It, it was just a, it's a small sort of farmhouse. And uh, went around, came through the back, and that's where the, the shed was, where they had found uh, uh, Mrs. Warden's body. Each passing hour unearthed new horrors at the Gein farmhouse. Headlines screamed tales of necrophilia, cannibalism, and grave robbing. Well, as it turned out, he had robbed uh, half a dozen, a dozen graves and taken the, the, the corpses and made death masks with them and, and uh, uh, collected skulls and did upholstery. It uh, was uh, just it's not unimaginable, and you, when you sat down and dictated it, uh, to the office in Chicago to, to send it all over the world. You know, it was, it was an absolute house of horrors, and, and no one would believe it at first that this could be. And Gein would read the, the burial notices and see which, which women of beyond the ages of 50 or so had died and been buried, and then he would go out that night and dig up the particular body, take it back to his... Uh, uh, house and uh, perform uh, you know, all kinds of surgical procedures on it. Revelations that Ed Gein had been stealing bodies from the local cemetery were devastating to the people of Plainfield. Well, the grave robbing was, was very shocking also because uh, we didn't know how many and of course practically everyone had lost someone within that period of years and uh, you didn't know if it was someone of your family or, or some of your friends or whatever. The little town of Plainfield had another agony to endure, the funeral of Bernice Warden. Bernice Warden's funeral was uh, uh, like something to behold because they had uh, put Mrs. Warden back together again and had a, uh, uh, an open casket uh, funeral at uh, her uh, church in Plainfield and the uh, minister 
had uh, said in, in his, uh, in the column sermon or eulogy that uh, many people there were wondering if, if God had forgotten Plainfield. If God had forgotten Plainfield, the souvenir hunters and curiosity seekers hadn't. A little steady stream of reporters. My folks owned the country store at the time, and they were in there from early morning to late at night, and just one right after another. And curiosity seekers, there was thousands of them. And the traffic was bumper to bumper from Plainfield out to his house and back, and all the crossroads. And you couldn't believe it. All the local people wanted was to forget the horrors and bury the past. Ed Gein's house was put up for auction. Days before the big sale, Ed's house burned to the ground. I am glad that the house burned down uh, so that they, there was always talk of uh, somebody buying it and making a house of horrors and charging money to go through it. And uh, I'm glad it's gone so that uh, that part was not uh, carried out. Flames devoured the building, but not the legend. Like a plague of locusts, crowds kept returning to the Gein Farm in Plainfield, Wisconsin. The shy little bachelor had seized a dark corner in American folklore. We'll be back with the blood-curdling conclusion of Psycho, the story of Ed Gein, in a moment. As in the movie, Ed Gein talked for hours to psychiatrists about his mother, his fetishes, and the more he talked, the more horrifying the final chapter became. He was a cannibal. He was a necrophiliac. That is, he made love to dead bodies. There isn't a barrier which Ed Gein did not break. Ed began confessing his sins. He still maintained he was innocent of murder, but when asked about the grave robbing and his morbid collection of trophies, he opened up. In some of the skin from that one woman, I probably put some oil on, possibly. That's all. You soften it up now. What kind of oil, Eddie? Penetrating oil. Would you wear the rubber gloves? With Mary Hogan, I'd. Stay right on it. Did. How would you make the face masks? I'd make them with mattress, see. I'd pack them with, right out with paper so they'd dry. And sometimes break a little salt on them. Why the salt? They turn a greenish color. Beginning to decay? I think that's right. You know, cheap, no good. It's all dried out. Just answer the questions, Eddie, and we'll get you another sandwich. So, when you went to the cemetery, did you open the entire casket or just one of the halves? Just half. And then slip them out? And that's right. I don't think he felt any guilt at all. His whole attitude was one of uh, perplexity about what everybody was so upset about. Why is everyone so concerned? It's a matter of... It was a matter of very little consequence to him. Townspeople recalled other confessions Ed made, confessions they dismissed as jokes. In the wintertime, it got kind of boring in the afternoon, so I'd go over there and sit with whoever was tending the store. And one day, Eddie Gein was there and Irene, and, and we sat around the stove and we rehashed what it might have happened to uh, Mary Hogan. I had a brilliant idea, and I said to Irene, you know, I think I know what happened to Mary Hogan. And she said, what? And I said, well, I think Eddie ran off with her here. I said, you know, he's such a lady killer. <laughs> and uh, he laughed. He said, yeah, and yum, yum, was she good? And I said, oh, my God, Ed, what a terrible thing to say. Mary Hogan's head was recovered at the Gein farm. Ed thought she looked like his mom. Eddie, was there any resemblance in the faces to that of your mother's? Maybe. It could be. Would you ever wear any of the faces over your own face? Yeah. Do you think you would wear the mask for a prolonged time? 
Not too long. I have other things to do. Maybe about an hour or so. Eddie, would you ever wear a pair of women's panties over your own body? <laughs> that could be. More than just wearing women's panties, on full moon nights, Eddie danced in the skins of women. In 1968, ten years after his arrest, Ed Gein was found mentally fit to stand trial. The verdict? Not guilty by reason of insanity. In 1974, Ed Gein petitioned the court asking to be released from Central State Mental Hospital on the grounds that he'd recovered from his illness. Again, he was examined by psychiatrists. In one test, doctors asked Ed to interpret well-known sayings. What do people mean when they say, people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones? Everybody has something they want to cover up. Don't cry over spilt milk. What's done is done. Don't dig up the past. Still water runs deep. Mm -hmm. and some people are calm on the surface, but high as underneath. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Mm. If you have a bird in the hand, uh, you might squeeze him and kill him. Ed wasn't let out. He was to spend the rest of his days in hospital care. Years earlier, when he'd first been arrested and was facing a life of confinement, Ed remarked, I'm glad it came out this way. I think it's better for me. Ed Gein died in 1984. He's buried next to his mother, his father, and brother, in the same cemetery he used to rob. The movie Psycho went on to become a sequel, then another sequel. The movie Texas Chainsaw Massacre was also largely based on these crimes, as was the current movie The Silence of the Lambs, Long after the movies are forgotten, though, the terrible legend of Ed Gein will live on in Wisconsin. Back in a moment. <laughs>